I'm Chris Shea. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Admissions here at William Peace University. And first and foremost, welcome to you and your students to the Pacer family. We're very much a Pacer um, a very much a family here at William Peace. Um, we know how important this next step is for your students and we're here to help. So I have my esteemed colleagues here who are the experts in all things orientation, housing, student life. They're just fabulous. So we're excited to chat with you all tonight. I think what we'll do is they have a, obviously a PowerPoint presentation prepared that they'll walk through. I'm happy to monitor chat um, to the best of my ability, maybe with some lower hanging fruit <laughs> questions. But for the experts at the end, when we conclude, we can then open it up um, and they'll be able to answer your your chats um, together. So maybe we'll we'll do it that way. Um, so with no further ado, I think I will start by introducing Kristen Cook, who's our Director of Campus and Student Life and Student Involvement. Sorry, Kristen. No, you're fine. Hi, everyone. Um, like Chris said, my name is Kristen. Um, I am our Director of Student Involvement here at William Peace University. And so I oversee our student involvement on campus, as well as our orientation process. So I'll touch on student involvement today, but the majority of what I'll focus on is mostly the orientation experience. But if you have questions about either, feel free to let me know. Um, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself before we start? Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Alex Huffer, and I'm the Director of Residence Life here at William Peace University. Um, myself and the Residence Life team, of which there are four of us, oversee all of the campus housing op options, as well as some involvement inside of our residence halls. Uh, we help with realistically a lot of things, uh, but our primary focuses are going to be evening uh, activities inside the living space, roommate relations, and just sort of navigating the college environment. Great. And then I'll also be sharing a few, um, a little bit of information also about our PACER family program. Um, so I'll be speaking, I should have mentioned earlier, I'll also be speaking a little bit about those opportunities um, as well that you can engage in now and into the fall and spring semesters and throughout the time that your students here at William Peace. Um, so I'll start a little bit, just give you an overview of some student involvement things, some orientation, face your family, and then Alex will cover our residence life and housing and our disability support services. Um, but student involvement, our office is basically your students one stop shop for getting involved on campus. We help make connections for them um, to get involved, make friends, build their community while they're here um, and get involved in things outside of the classroom. So hopefully, you know, joining a student organization, maybe taking on a leadership role, volunteering um, and or just attending an event. We host a lot of our campus wide events, so we kind of cover all of those areas as well as oversee our new student experience which includes orientation. So that's kind of who we are. Um, we hope that students will get involved so they can make friends, uh, build that community while they're here and maybe away from you um, or spending a lot of their time here if they're commuting. Um, we hope that students will obviously have a balanced life while they're here, find um, engagement and um, friends and activities outside of the classroom to uh, you know, prioritize their mental health, prepare them for their future careers, build that self-confidence. Um, a lot of the work that we do with students and student leaders, one of the biggest things they say is that when they leave working with our office, they leave with confidence that they feel like they can take into an internship or um, grad school or whatever's next for them. So that's something that we actively try to help support and make sure students are finding those opportunities to gain those skills before they leave um, and prepare them for the real world. And these are just some pictures from our previous events. Um, so ways that they can get involved are we obviously have student organizations on campus. Um, if they don't see an organization that they want uh, on campus and they want to start it, we also help facilitate that process. It's really simple for students to start an organization on campus. So we meet with students, do consults with them and help them start their group. Um, this year alone, we started five new student organizations. So every year there's new ones popping up based on student interests. So that's a really great thing for people to do. We don't really recommend them jumping straight into that their first year, but if they're eager and want to, they can come talk to us um, for sure. We have an app um, as called the Cork C O R Q um, app, where folks can students can download that, log in, and search what events are happening on campus, what student organizations we have, just kind of what is going on. Um, so we encourage students when they get here at orientation, we'll plug it um, a lot as well as the first week that they're here. Um, that's what this QR code on the screen will will take you to is to be able to download that app. 
Um, or if you are on a desktop, you can search for Pacer Engage, um, pacerengage.peace.edu. It's the same um, interface. And so that's a great way for students to kind of see what's going on on campus and get involved. Um, we also have a student government on campus, so our Student Government and Programming Association, or SGPA. We always look for first-year class representatives as well as other class representatives. So if your student's a transfer student, they can come and get involved in that way and kind of get their foot in the door. If they maybe did student government in high school, that's a great way to just stay involved. Um, but other ways to be involved is also just come to things. Come to an event, meet a friend, um, come get to know our staff. Uh, we do volunteer opportunities as well, so they can just come and volunteer um, and get involved that way. Or we also employ orientation leaders. So if they had a great first semester, first year, and they want to apply to be that leader for somebody else, um, they can do that as well. And their spring semester is applied to be a student orientation leader. So those are some ways that they can get involved in our office. Um, but I wanted to talk the chunk of this time about orientation. So talked briefly about that, happy to answer any questions at the end, but um, the bulk of what people typically want to know this time of year is about orientation because it's right around the corner. Um, our orientation process is three phases. The first phase is an online pre-orientation module. So your student will get access to that on Monday and um, it's through our Moodle um, course platform. So students will be using Moodle in their classes. So this is a great chance for them to get to know the platform, um, understand how to use it. And in that platform will be a lot of Im important information regarding financial aid, like frequently asked questions, um, our student accounts and billing. So, you know, getting to know what those offices do and like what questions might um, come up and maybe being able to answer some of those questions before um, they even arise. Um, there's some information about our on-campus technology, there's information around our Center for Student Success, my office, our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion office, Residence Life and Housing, and move-in information. So it's just a wealth of resources. Um, and we will also be sending out that information to parents and families this year as well in a slightly different form because you can't log into Moodle without your students' information. Obviously, if they share that information, you're welcome to log in and, and poke around in their Moodle course. But if they don't provide you that login information, I'll be sending that information in a slightly different form for you all. And I'll explain how in the next slide. Um, so you all can also have access to those videos and that content if that is of interest to you. Um, so that will launch next week. Uh, so if you are attending June orientation, then your student would just need to go through, do the couple quizzes that are on there, download the couple of really important documents we want them to download, um, and complete that course before they come to our in-person orientation. Um, so that is our phase one, is the Moodle pre-orientation module course. And then the second phase of orientation is your traditional summer orientation. And this is a super fun weekend. We uh, do an overnight experience for students. So they get to come on campus on a Friday, either in June or July, and spend that whole day with us. Um, alongside you all, you're invited to attend as well. We have a whole program just for families and guests. And we do some sessions together, some are separate. So students get to meet other students. Um, you will get to meet other families and, and supporters of students. And we just have a really, really great day. Um, you'll hear from some really important campus partners. We have a community lunch for you to get to know some people who work here um, more one-on-one. -on -one. And then we have opportunities as well for to take a campus tour to um, set up some appointments with people. Maybe you have some questions that came up during the day. You can do some drop-in appointments. Um, and then students get to stay the night um, if they are... Um, wanting to stay the night. If, you, if your student's a commuter, it is optional. They don't have to stay the night if they don't want to, but if your student's residential, it is a requirement to stay overnight. And that night we do lots of fun things. So the parents and families leave and we, you know, give them some free time to engage in some optional social activities to kind of maybe take an introvert break if they need that. And then we do some late night programming with them. So last year we had like a foam party and a DJ and blacklight dodgeball and crafts. And we just kind of have fun and show them what some events look like um, during the school year and kind of give them a taste of what it could be like to be a student here. And then Saturday, everyone comes back. You all can come back as well. And we have some final sessions and we end orientation with one of my favorite traditions um, that you will see when you come to orientation, but it is one of the traditions that students only get to do twice, and one of them is at orientation. So that's a really special moment. Um, 
but it's just a great time to one, see campus again, to stay on campus for the first time. We try to pair your student with if they already know who their roommate is and they're going to the same orientation, we try to put them together so that they can start having those conversations about living together. Um, and it's just a great time for them to, to make friends, to meet some, some uh, returning older students who are their orientation leaders, and for you all to get to know campus, hear about more resources and connect with each other um, who might become some of your support system while your students here. So that's phase two is our summer new student orientation. And then our final process for this whole new student experience is in the fall. Um, we do basically a new student welcome. They're called Pacer Days, um, new Pacer Days. And so those are basically the days from when you, your student moves in until the first day of classes. We have four days of um, some more information regarding like some of the the business things we need to cover, like Title IX training, uh, campus safety, making sure they know you know who to call and um, what are the procedures and policies for living on campus if they live on campus. But it's also lots of fun things as well. So they get they are in small groups again, and those small groups are going to be their first year seminar course. Um, so all the students who are going to be in a class with them are part of this group that they navigate those four days with, and. They'll get to meet their peer mentor. They'll get to, um, we have events like uh, self-care stations where they get to learn about different ways that they could take care of themselves through the fall semester. Um, they get to meet with the wellness center. We have an involvement fair. We take a class photo. We have our academic convocation. So it's kind of a mix of those. Um, you know, We need to make sure we cover this with you all as new members of our community, but also with let's have some fun and like welcome to college. Um, and let's start making friends and building community. So those are what our new Pacer days are. Um, and again, they pick up right after move in and take them up until their first, their first day of class. So um, those are kind of the three parts of that. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of just things that come up. Um, you could talk more in detail, but um, if your student has deposited and has not signed up for orientation, definitely um, encourage them to do so. If you're planning to attend, there's a, an item where they can add you as a guest. Please have them add you because we'll have a name tag ready for you. That helps us get a good count for food and for providing um, refreshments for you all. And then, um, you know, remind your student before they come to orientation, have you done your, your Moodle online modules before going to orientation? Because that is um, we want them to cover that content before they come. So that way, um, some it's not the first time hearing some of these things and it's we can hit on different things in person than we did online. So want them to be familiar with some of the items on there. And then, then they just need to attend and we'll kind of take it from there. Um, but those are kind of the steps to get to get your student to the first part of orientation, which is our summer orientation. That was a lot of me talking. Um, Chris, are there any questions I should answer now? I just responded to one, Kristen. Okay. Um, a person, an individual asked about registering for fall classes. And I just said, if the student is a first time student, they've gotten a survey to complete yes. um, and they'll receive their schedule at orientation, but certainly you'll expand on that probably. <laughs> yes. Yes. So actually I wasn't planning to. So thank you for that prompt. Um, okay. At orientation, one of our um, longest, like most important sessions is if you are, if your student is a first time in college student, they will receive their physical schedule at orientation. So um, there'll be time where they're, they'll meet with an academic advisor, they'll receive their schedule and they'll be able to look it over. The academic advisor will explain it. Um, and then if you, if your student needs to make any changes, there will be time during the day for you, for them to meet with an academic advisor and make any adjustments that need to be made. Um, so it is important that they fill out that advising form before they come to orientation. So that way we have a schedule to give to them. Um, if your student's a transfer student, they are doing virtual meetings over the summer to build that schedule just because there are a lot of unique needs for transfer students. Um, so they should set up that appointment um, once they are. And I'll just add that if your student perhaps missed the email, because we know that happens in their portal where they applied, if they click on next steps, those checklist items will come up and you'll see the link to, to complete that survey for advising or set up the transfer appointment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Slate is your best resource right now. <laughs> has everything. And, in yeah. It. Yeah. That's all about the application portal. And then Kristen, one more, when they sleep over at orientation, do they need to bring anything like sleeping bags, sheets, pillows, et cetera? It won't be there set for the term, correct? 
Yes. So it, um, they will need to, we'll provide a packing list. That's one of the um, communications we'll be sending out in the next two weeks um, of just what to bring, what to expect, what to pack. Um, but yes, bringing basic linens, um, their favorite pillow, um, a few other like toiletries, there are any medications they take on a regular basis. Um, and it will not likely be the exact room that they will be in in the fall. So they will have to take everything with them and then come back for move in day and move in. So this should be like packing for a one night overnight experience, um, but with linens. Um, if someone were to forget linens, we have a limited supply where we can provide those. Like if you get all the way here and you live five hours away and you forgot yours, we will have you covered, but um, you'll want to bring your own just to make it comfy. But yes, it will be not necessarily the exact room that you'll be in in the fall, just because of updates Thanks. and renovations on campus. Thanks, Kristen. And then there was someone that said, if you're a fall student, do you not need to go to summer orientation? I know there's often confusion um, for students that are starting in the fall in August that the summer orientation is to prepare them for that fall entry. Correct. Anyone starting in the fall semester, transfer student or first time in college, everyone has to attend summer orientation um, to prepare for the fall. Yes. So the summer is just to be able to provide the information for you all to get prepared for that first day of class in August. So yes, all fall admits go through summer orientation. And Rachel, I will address um, your question individually. She just won't be able to come with her daughter. So she wants to have information emailed to her. So I'll jot down her Great. information, Kristen, and we'll follow up. Yes. And if you list your information as a guest still, and even if you can't come to the orientation, we'll have your name and we send out all the PowerPoints and resources after the fact for any of the guests that we have registered. So if you want your student to go ahead and list you as a guest, we'll now have your email and we'll send you out all the post communication um, which is helpful. So even if you don't plan to come, feel free to have your student add you as a guest. Great. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, one more. No, um, if, if the student has been taking community college classes through a high school program, co very common question. So thank you. Would they be considered a transfer student? And they will not. Um, even if a student has achieved an associate degree while in high school, which is fabulous, they're still considered first year students with advanced standing. Transfer students are only students that attended college after graduating from high school. Good mm -hmm. question. Yes. And transfers and first years both come to the same orientation. There's only really one session that's different if they are a transfer or a first time in college. And what group they're in is different. But those are pretty much the only differences. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Great. <laughs> well, if any more questions come up, feel free to add them in the chat. I am going to talk briefly just about our, um, well, I have this slide and then I'll talk briefly about the Pacer Family Program. But these are the dates. This is very important. I don't know why I forgot to click this slide. Um, our June orientation is June 21st through the 22nd. Uh, July is July. That's supposed to say July 19th through July 20th. Sorry about that. And then our new student welcome is from move in day, which is August 16th through Tuesday, August 20th. Students start classes on the 21st. So that those are the dates. So if you're considering June or July, um, if you can go to either, I'd recommend June, just because the sooner your student can get their schedule, the better, in my opinion. Sooner they can make adjustments if they need adjustments. There's more options for classes. So if you can come to June, I highly recommend June. If you can't come to June, obviously July is great. There's still plenty of time. Um, but that's really the only difference between the two. Um, and if you have conflicts with both dates, just have your student or you um, can email orientation at peace.edu and I'll work with you one-on-one. -on -one um for which for what for what we'll do moving forward um and then that new student welcome for, the only difference is friday um, august 16th is for our residential students and for our transfer or commuter students they don't begin our um, new pacer days until saturday so they'll get slightly different communication if they are a transfer student or if they are a commuter um, but if you're a first year residential student friday is the start time for that and Kristen, um, one more. Um, yeah. Do fall sport athletes arrive before the Pacer days? If they are a rostered student athlete on volleyball, men's soccer, or women's soccer, I believe those are the only three. I could be wrong. I'm looking at Alex. But um, if you are rostered on a fall sport, then yes, you get to move in um, early. And but your like new pacer days don't start any earlier than anyone else's, but you do move in a day early um, just so that you can get 
ready for practice and scrimmages and such. Thank you. Which I believe Alex covers, but yeah. So those are the dates. Again, the July orientation, that should be Friday, July 19th and July 20th. Uh, so mark your calendars for that. And you can, if your student's deposited, you can register now. Um, if you registered for one and need to switch it, it's very simple for me to switch it for you. So feel free to also email orientation at peace.edu and I can get your student transferred to a different one. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about our PACER family program, which I don't oversee, but um, is a, our resources available to you as families. And so I'm covering you on behalf of a colleague today. And so this is a way just for parents and families and support systems of students to have, um, ongoing support throughout, you know, having a student in college and just ways for you to engage with the university, stay connected. So, um, this is your main source of communication once your student is enrolled here and helps keep families engaged and part of the process because you are our biggest supporter of students. And it's really important that you also feel comfortable with your student being here. So um, PACER Family Program oversees lots of communication, like I said, and different events and initiatives, um, which I can speak more on. But the biggest one is our family portal. This one, this is huge. Our family portal is the easiest way to stay up to date with information that goes out to parents and families. Um, campus news goes out. Um, events uh, go out, especially like we had recently our um, senior week for our graduating seniors, and we sent out some information to families about senior week. Just in case your student's a senior, you can be like, oh, are you going to this and that? And just knowing what's happening on campus, even if it's not meant for families and um, supporters, but just having it uh, available to you so you know what's going on on campus, the opportunities that your student's having. Um, and sometimes that includes events for families in particular. Kristen, I just had one more yeah. question. Sorry. Do okay. most students attend orientation in June or are they equally attended typically? They're typically evenly attended. I would say there's about uh, maybe 110 in June and about 90 in July. So they're almost matched. June typically has slightly more, but only by like 10 to 20 students. Great. But the Thank groups you. are generally the same size because sometimes we will adjust the number of groups to keep the groups the same size. So. But yes, I had one, this is, same. sorry, specific to the deposit, where the students already provided information for paying the deposit. And yes, that's actually sent out at the point of admission. So again, if they want to go into their student portal, they will see, right, there's three buttons and pay my deposit is one of the buttons and accept my offer of admission. So it should be super clear if your student just goes back into the portal they use to apply. And if you have any problems, honestly, with any of that, um, that's more my end of things. My email address is kmmarieshay at peace.edu. I'd be happy to help you and not interfere with Kristen's <laughs> and Alex's area. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Um, but yeah, Pacer Family Portal. Um, great avenue for communication um, for you. And we'll be the main source that we send out information regarding family weekend, which is one of the biggest events the Pacer Family Program oversees is bringing families to campus um, for a weekend just so you can engage with campus, see um, what it's like for your student to be here, meet some of us again now that your student has been here, um, go to some fun events and just be part of the WPU community for a weekend. Um, we also this past year did care packages. So for e at the end of each semester, put together a care package that you could, you know, pay for us to deliver to your student and provide a note of encouragement for your student as they go into finals. So one semester it was, you know, an energy drink and some snacks and a different like promo items. Like one year we had a cooling towel and like a fan, um, or a gift card to an ice cream shop that's across the street, just different things that you could purchase just to like encourage your student at finals and we do all the labor um, for it. So different things like that, those opportunities pop up through the family portal. So I would highly recommend um, subscribing to it and, and um, signing up for the portal communications. Um, just to stay in the know. Um, and as well as your student goes towards graduation, we the family program does things like you can purchase flower bouquets to pick up at graduation to provide your student, different services like that that are geared towards um, families and parents. So that is a little bit about the portal. And um, just something else to keep in mind is 
like I said, family weekend is scheduled for the weekend of November 1st through the 3rd right now. Um, you'll get a lot more information about that at orientation and different invitations in the mail. But if you're wanting to go ahead and book your, uh, like mentally prepare for that, it is the weekend of November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Do you have anything to add, Chris, about the portal? Honestly, Kristen, I was just looking for the link. Do we have a link anywhere to provide them direct access? I'm I sorry. Will, I will look for that when Alex starts if that is okay. Okay. And then someone asked, can you repeat the date? And I'm so sorry, but which date? The date of orientation? Family weekend is November 1st through the 3rd, if that's what someone Maybe wanted. that's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But yes, I will get the, I don't have it memorized because that's not my area, but I'll find it. Yeah, me either. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> I should have it memorized, but <laughs> all right. Well, I'll pass it over to Alex. And then if there's any more questions that come through, Chris, I can answer those at the end. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. All right. Go for it, Alex. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, so again, my name is Alex Uffer. I'm the director of residence life and housing here at William Peace. Um, so just a very brief overview of our office and what it is that the four of us work on for you all. Um, so these are some of the areas that we oversee most predominantly. This first line is actually a thing that I should have updated before we joined today. So we've actually recently shifted to a two-year live-on requirement. Uh, so all of our students are going to be required to live on campus for either for both their first and second years, unless they meet any of the commuter the commuter exceptions. And we'll go over those a little bit later. Uh, but just know that we plan for and guarantee that we have the ability to house all of your students for their first two years. And we may and we often have the ability to house students for all four years, depending on what their preferences are. There does seem to be about an even split of students who choose to move off into the community and look for things, but we're also able to retain a very high percentage up to their graduation date. And I think that that's something that's pretty special if they choose to keep keep living with us even when they get the option. My office will also work with your students about their meal plans. Uh, so during the housing sign-up process, you should have received information about choosing a meal plan. If they do choose to make changes to that, they can simply email myself or our office and we'll make changes on their behalf in the computer, or the computer system. Some other very frequent questions, but to get some information here are about vehicles. So any student, including first-year students, can bring a vehicle. Uh, they just have to make sure that they purchase a parking pass uh, and that was through our student accounts office, but I believe that the link should be in the Moodle. I see Kristen on that. He saw us and I was correct on that one. Uh, so we do have a very large lot. Um, it is pretty conveniently located. Uh, right, There is spark parking spaces immediately outside of the first year residence halls, as well as some a little bit farther away. And by a little bit farther away, I mean about 200 yards. So very convenient parking on our campus. Uh, some information about our housing styles. Uh, so all of our first year residence halls are in a suite style with a shared bathroom. So we don't offer anything with a communal style bath. Uh, which might be a little bit more of what you would imagine as a college dorm. Uh, so all of our students live, all of our first year students live in suites with two beds on each side and then a communal shared bathroom. Um, so the maximum people ever be sharing a bathroom with is three others. And that's worked out really well for us. I found that our students really enjoy it. Uh, the only difference there being so not really difference, but one of the things I think is important to remember is that your student is going to be required to clean and care for that space themselves, as well as provide their own supplies. So as you're going through that packing, just making sure that you're thinking about toilet paper, uh, cleaning supplies and ways to keep that space neat and tidy. Some of the things that we work providing you in terms of specific services is that we do a lot of smaller scale programming. So anything that is very large, like looking at the entire campus, I'll always run through Kristen, but we do a lot of smaller scale, uh, just smaller community building inside the residence halls themselves. Uh, so we do smaller bits of crafting. We do some TV, some games, just things that we can bring people who live together, uh, together in their space. And I'm sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Uh, other things that we do is we provide 24 hour on call support for emergencies and crisis. So between myself and the other professional staff members of the residence life team, there is always a professional staff member available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Even when your student is not there, we are still going to be there and available. There's also an additional layer of support for crisis and emergencies, which are going to be our RA student staff. Uh, so when your student is living in our building, if they have a concern or a worry any time, day or night, they can call the RAs. The RAs have the direct line to professional staff, and we can also work really closely with public safety to make sure that people are being supported and secure in all the aspects of their lives. 
Uh, this is also an important thing for you to know. If there is ever a situation where you are struggling to contact your student, you can contact our public safety office who will work with us to locate your student and make sure that they give you a call. That is a service that we provide fairly regularly. Other things we have in terms of just very basic facilities is that we provide wired and wireless internet access high speed throughout our entire campus uh, and also specifically throughout our residence. Halls. So every single room in the residence halls will have two Ethernet ports as well as that high-speed wireless. Uh, for their entertainment, we do provide some Spectrum U and or streaming services at no cost. Uh, our residence halls also include a variety of common areas for socializing and studying with limited kitchenettes as well. So one of the buildings has a full stove and refrigerator, and then every floor of the communities has at least a microwave. The one facility that does have the stove is available and open to students from both Ross and Davidson Hall, which is where first year students will live. Uh, and so that will be available for both. I did see the question just come through chat about refrigerators and microwaves inside of the residence halls. So your student is welcome to bring their own refrigerator and microwave and bring it in. A micro or a refrigerator needs to be less than 3.3 cubic feet. Uh, so that is just the traditional dorm size, that smaller one. Uh, and I would really encourage your student to reach out and communicate with their incoming roommate to determine who's going to bring that. I've seen two refrigerators work out really well. I don't think that two microwaves is necessary in every resident's small room. I think that that is a space where students often choose to share. Um, and I think that's all I have on this slide in terms of our facilities. I think that our facilities work out pretty well. We do have full air conditioning that works really well. And that I think is really important being in the South. Being a person who has previously worked in the North, I've actually worked at a lot of schools that did not have air conditioning in first year residence hall facilities. Uh, so I wanna tell you that we do have it, it is very convenient. And I did see a question about roommates. I'm gonna to get to that in a couple of slides. Uh, Here's just some information about how you're going to go about signing up for housing. So the housing application has been made available to you through Slate. Uh, so if you have not completed it yet, I would highly encourage you to do so as housing is assigned on a first come first serve basis. Uh, we do expect to be very near our capacity limit this year. So we absolutely want to get people's information in so we can start placing them. Uh, and I do absolutely do my best to accommodate student requests and preferences. And when we say we here, I mean myself, because I do the assignments. Uh, and I, if your student tells me that they want to be on a first floor, I will absolutely do my best to get them on the first floor. If they prefer the higher floor, I can take it. I've received all sorts of interesting requests, and I absolutely do my best to fulfill them. Uh, and especially with student roommates, if you give me that one, I absolutely want to place you with someone else. I do see a couple questions that just came through about that. So let me go ahead and answer all of these. So in terms of finding out what dorm you're going to be placed in, I'm going to be sending out that information in early June. So I am just now this week wrapping up the closing of last semester. We went through, check all our facilities, check for any maintenance needs. And I am sitting down just this week to start pairing your students. My absolute goal and intention is that your students should know what building and room they're gonna be in before they arrive for orientation. However, there is always the opportunity that I'm really hopeful for that at orientation, they're gonna meet a new best friend that they wanna live with. So if they meet someone, they're free to contact us afterwards and say, hey, can my roommates, can my room assignment to be changed so I can live with this person and I will make those adjustments where possible. So I will give you my best preliminary placement. But there is a slight possibility that will change between your initial information in June and the end of the year, depending on how many students and hopefully yours identifies who they want to live with. And as far as roommates for student athletes, roommates for student athletes are ultimately going to be treated the exact same way from my office as every other roommate. Uh, so if your student identifies that they want to live with this particular individual and that particular individual identifies your student as well, that's a perfect match in my world and I'll place them together. Otherwise, I generally don't place students that are athletes together just because they exist on the same team. So one of the parts of the housing application will ask your student a lot of just personal preference questions about do they like to study with headphones? Do they like to watch TV at night? What time do they go to bed? How clean or messy are they? And things of that nature. So when I'm placing and pairing roommate assignments without an individual selected, I actually lean more towards like what are the personality traits your student identified rather than the specific uh, team affiliation because I found a little bit more success in that way myself. Uh, but do know if for some reason that they get on campus and there is an issue, we also have a room change process. I can make some parent changes on the back end. 
Uh, moving on on this page, uh, there is information, of course, as I, I'm realizing I already talked about a lot of this. Uh, so once you've arrived on campus and had your orientation, I will provide an additional email out to you with just some form about how you can let me know if you want to make changes to your meal plan or your housing assignment. Um, we're going to work on that. I did ask some information about single occupancy. Again, I am currently anticipating not having any space for single occupancy. I'm very excited that so many students are excited to join us, which has really limited that opportunity. But if I do have any availability for single rooms, I will be simply placing them in the order the students requested them. So that is going to be the biggest drive to make sure that we're completing those as soon as possible. So as it says here, you'll receive your building assignment in June and make plans for move in. Uh, and again, we're just very excited to live with and uh, learn and grow with your students this year. Kristen, if you can pop me up. Perfect. Thank you. So I already said that there is, we do have a two-year residency requirement unless you meet any of our commuter criteria. And so here they are on the page. So students who are guaranteed to receive commuter status are students who are 22 years or older by the first day of class. Again, for this year, that's going to be August 21st of 2024. Students who are married or have dependents, students who are living with with a parent or guardian at their permanent address within a 50 mile radius from William Peace University. And so we will ask for your home address as we do that. Um, I did have one individual that was in the midst of a move from another state to the Raleigh region last year. If you happen to fall into that specific category, send me an email and we'll work out your situation. Uh, we also have students who have been enrolled for three years in a college or university after completion of high school are guaranteed to receive commuter status. Uh, some students with medical conditions, and we're going to talk about this when we get to disability services, and students who are experiencing extreme financial hardship. So if you're in a situation where the financial component of living on campus is going to be um, it would preclude your ability to attend our institution. Send myself or my office an email with residence life at peace.edu or a huffer at peace.edu, and I'll send you what that looks like. Predominantly it involves just writing a statement of exactly what is going on, how are you here, and then I'll work with financial aid to determine uh, who should be excused in that region. Thank you very much, Kristen. So if you're planning to commute, I still need to be able to account for you. Uh, so you absolutely need to commute, submit a commuter application to receive approval from my office. That link should be available with the housing application. If you are having trouble locating it, let me know. I'm happy to send it out. It's a very common request. Um, but I, absol I absolutely need to account for every student. So even students who are commuting, even if you read one of these criteria that you know will be approved, I still need to be able to see it and approve it for you. It's part of our coding system at the institution. Um, and it's also really important that students know that it impacts our financial aid package. So please get those applications in as soon as possible. Because living on campus is part of the cost of attendance, it really does change what sort of grants and loans your student is eligible for. And that's also why part of that whole community thing, I have to get you coded correctly. So we just want to make sure that we're making sure that your financial aid is appropriate for your situation. Over here, I have a little bit of information about Disability Support Services. Uh, so Disability Support Services is an office that I partner with very frequently. So I did mention before that students with a medical condition are or can sometimes be exempted from the requirement to live on campus, as well as students who have a documented disability or require any form of housing accommodation works with disability support services and that makes its way back to me. And so a lot of these are situations where a student has a medical need for a single room. And this is a thing that we absolutely can accommodate if you are medically, if it is medically necessary for you to have a single room, I will make it happen for you. Uh, so the way that this works is a student who has documented medical uh, needs would send their an email from their William Peace University to disability at peace.edu. A faculty or parent can also make a referral, but ultimately the student will need to lead this process themselves. Uh, so Disability Services will connect directly with your student to talk to them about how do they submit their documentation. Uh, and Disability Support Services will review that documentation and just communicate with your student about what it is that they need and how they can be helped on our campus. And I do want to stress that all of this stuff happens entirely with the Student Disability Support Services. So at no point will myself, dining, or any academic staff learn what a student-specific medical situation is uh, that is held entirely by Disability Support Services staff. Uh, disability Support staff and the student after reviewing, we'll actually send 
documentation to the other offices of what a student specific accommodations are. Uh, so once they have communicated those out, it is then our duty on our end to fulfill those accommodations. Uh, so for example, if you have a student who has a medical necessity to have a single room, they would work disability services, they would provide their documentation to disability services, disability services will send me an email our disability support services will send me an email saying this student requires a single room. That's all the information that I receive. That's all the information I need. And we will do our best to accommodate all of those. Uh, the only caveat that I do want to tell you in this area is it is once again really important to make sure that we're doing this as quickly as possible. Uh, like as soon as possible, we want to start this process. Uh, sometimes students have to go back to a provider, provide additional documentation, do some additional meetings. And then also just because of the first come first serve basis of housing, I will be able to accommodate your needs. I may not be able to accommodate the need in the building you want if we don't have it in quite quickly enough. Uh, so that is just one thing that we want to keep an eye out for. I believe there is an additional slide here. There was not. Perfect. Uh, this is just some additional stuff about disability support services. Uh, so Again, to speak on their behalf, they're more than happy to help your student and able to help your student if they have academic needs, such as extended testing time, reduced distraction rooms, additional note taker, additional note takers, excuse me. Uh, but then for my area, most commonly, uh, we provide commuter status for students who are unable to live in our communities, housing modifications for students who need a larger refrigerator, single rooms, uh, students who must be on the first floor, students with emotional support animals, service animals, things of that nature. And then also through me with those meal accommodations. Uh, so if your student has a significant allergy or other thing that would impact their ability to work on campus, that's another, or to live on, to eat on campus, Campus, that is another area that disability support services and myself can help you out. Uh, but those are all the slides that I have prepared. I am so I'm happy to take your questions. I also just shared our new student checklist um, with you all. It is a PDF document that your students will be receiving. And it's kind of your one-stop shop for all of the action that your student needs to take before they move in, if they're residential or before they start classes. Um, and they have links to some of the items we talked about today, like orientation registration, the housing application, and the commuter request form. So those are in there just for quick access. It will have your student log in with the same credentials that they use to apply to the institution. Um, so just is if they do have their new WPU email address and password, it is not that. It is um, their login credentials from when they actually applied to the institution, just in case you run into that. And as far as the, a question about FAFSA and scholarships, students are awarded and notified of their merit scholarships, which is based on their weighted GPAs in high school. That's in their offer of admission letter. So that again is back to the portal. It's in the portal um, in which they applied. FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid, which will help us consider students for federal and state need-based aid. Um, and loans as well. Super important. Don't make any assumptions. Please fill out the FAFSA. Um, it can only help. Um, and you might be pleasantly surprised at what we can provide. <laughs> so if you do have questions about that, now, you probably have heard about the delays in the FAFSAs um, nationally this year. The federal government made significant changes um, to make it easier. And in future years, I'm sure it will be. But the first year is always a little bumpy. So there have been delays nationally. A lot of colleges are still not packaging students. I think it's about half of colleges nationally are still not packaging. The rest of us have started. We have not packaged all of our admitted students yet. We are working on that. Um, so if you have questions, if you filed the FAFSA, but you haven't gotten a package yet, please feel free to either reach out to your admission counselor or financial aid, which is simply F-I-N-A-I-D. I'll put it in here, finaid at peace.edu. Um, and they will be very helpful. They're very responsive um, to help with the current status of, you can also, if your student has access their self-service and I'm not sure they have or haven't because sometimes they have to be packaged first. So I might be confusing people, but it is all visible in self-service. You might want to start with your student's admission counselor because we can access um, our colleague system, our student information system and see if the package um, is out there yet. So, but feel free, either your admission counselor or the financial aid office. 
Mm -hmm. And if your student is interested in federal work study, um, that is something that they do have to be approved and eligible for, and that is on the FAFSA. So make sure that they click that they are interested in federal work study um, because it, you can't get it retroactively. Um, you do have to be approved for it. So if they want to participate in federal work study, just make sure that that is filled out on the FAFSA as well. Thanks, Kristen. I'm not sure I know the entire answer to the next one. Payment options for the payment every semester. The yeah. scholarship definitely goes toward that. What we do is we take your direct billed expenses and deduct your scholarship. And that will be what you are billed for. Um, it gets a little confusing. The cost of intent of attendance also includes non-billed expenses like just transportation, living expenses. So what I find to be the simplest is look at the direct bill. That's what you're going to get a bill for and actually have to pay for. It. And that again is in the self-service account. We deduct the scholarship amount from that, divide by two and give you exactly what your student will owe for each semester. And for that, there are payment plans and, and many different ways that we can help. Um, we're definitely here for you. Our student accounts office does a great job. Um, so if you're at that point of paying, the, well, the bills, have, the bills will go out in mid-June. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it's just a matter of seeing, I believe what you would need to know would be the direct expenses, what your scholarship is, so that you have a sense for what the bill will be. However, if you file the FAFSA, there's even more deducted from your bill. That's why it's important to file that FAFSA. So you can see the bottom line, direct expenses minus scholarships minus need-based aid and loans equals what you will have to actually write a check for, if that helps. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you won't know until mid-June when the bills go out. And we'll be providing a copy of your current bill at orientation. So for our student account session, we will be providing you with a copy of like, as of that day, what does your bill look like? Um, that way, if you see any discrepancies, you can also book an appointment same day to talk to student accounts to clear up any maybe discrepancy or get your questions answered about what is on your bill. Um, so that's another a great reason for you to come to orientation, just because we do provide that um, as of that day, what your bill looks like, which maybe there might be some scholarship or loan still processing. So there might, you'll be able to get those questions answered, but it will give you a chance to look at what that is. Um, and also in the communication that goes out next week, um, there are videos in the Moodle course for students, and I will be sharing links for you all for the videos where we talk about what your payment plan options are, just to give you a heads up, and also just how to navigate things like financial aid self-service that Chris mentioned today, because um, it is there's so many portals, there's different places for each, and so we do have videos kind of walking you through step-by-step -step how your student can access those, um, just in case you forget and you need to reference that back. Um, so you'll have those as well. Scholarships for sports with um, being D3, we're not able to um, award scholarships specifically for sports. That's just a, a accreditation issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, so no to that, just based on merit and GPA. We do have other ancillary scholarships. So in addition to the, the GPA-based merit scholarship that was definitely in your sons and daughters um, admit letter, we have community service scholarships. If perhaps your, your student didn't highlight um, the fact that they're very involved, either, either in volunteer work or leadership work, they still can submit that information. And we award anywhere between $375 and $1,000, depending on the scope of what your students have been doing for community service. Um, we also have more specifically a legacy scholarship if a parent or grandparent is a graduate, that's $1,000 a year. Um, sibling scholarship for students that have a sibling currently concurrently enrolled at, at William Peace, that's a thousand dollars a year as well. Um if you're in the if your son or daughter's in the PTK, the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, and that happens in high school as well as college for students that are dual enrolled, that your students would get two thousand dollars a year in addition to that. So we do have quite a few additional scholarships. And if any of your students happen to be transfer students graduating from Wake Tech with an associate degree with a 3.0, they would get $2,000 a year as well. There's a question about um, how to resubmit the information for that community or leadership involvement. I would say to make it real simple, just send it to me and I'll take a look at it. I actually kind of make the final decision anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my email address in here just for ease and I'll let your son or daughter's um, admission counselor know 
that I'm relooking at it. Happy to do that. Any other questions that you all have? Oh yes, involvement, I can send you that email as well. Our emails are quite straightforward, I'm noticing. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> pretty pretty self-explanatory. Yes. <laughs> Um, specifically National Honor Society doesn't qualify, uh, you know, technically like if in NHS they get a scholarship, but it does, it can help in the admission process because of the strength of the, the student and it can help with leadership and community service because there is quite a bit of involvement involved <laughs> for students in NHS. So that could be kind of the community service leadership. It's both leadership and community service end of things. So if they've been really active in NHS, it could get them some funding toward that community service and leadership scholarship, At which, in which case you would just, again, email me directly. Lots of good questions. Love it. <laughs> And you have all of our email addresses. So we're here. Um, I'll give it just another second. Be sure we don't have any other questions. Thanks for logging on tonight, though, and um, hope to see you at orientation. So um, make sure your student lists you as a guest. Um, if they didn't have them, just email orientation at peace.edu. Happy to add you retroactively. Um, but we do hope to see you there. We have some fun sessions specifically for our families. So. Oh, Chromebooks over PC or vice versa. I think it's personal preference. We do off, we have Chromebooks um, on campus if your student needs to rent out a Chromebook for any reason, um, they are available in the library for rental. It's short-term rentals, like three days, and then you have to bring it back and then you can re-rent it out, but they're there. I would say, um, from my experience, from my observation around campus, I think that there is a slight lean towards PC over Chromebooks, but I do see a significant amount of both. So I think that your student would be comfortable either way. If they're simulation and game design, PC. 100% PC. They're more powerful. And I'm sorry, there's not a scholarship specifically for Skills USA. Sorry. Hate to end on that note. I know. <laughs> one more <Right>? question. <laughs> Give us a positive <laughs> one. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Kristen and Alex. As you all can see, um, your students will be in great hands with, with my colleagues. They just do a fabulous job. And, and please know it's it's real. We care. They're part of our community. We're small. We take care of each other. And we're just really thrilled that you're going to be joining our family this fall. It'll be a great few years for usually. <laughs> yes. Great. Okay. I think we've slowed down. Yep. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. You have all of our email addresses, so please reach out. Thanks y'all. Nice. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. I oh, have our max not recommended. <laughs> I don't think they're not recommended. Um, I know if you're simulation and game design, it tends to be better to have a PC. So I guess it depends on your major, but a lot of students also have Macs. So it's not that they're not recommended. Um, but again, if they're a game design, PCs just tend to adapt better with the software that they use. Nice. Thank you all for your comments. I know. So nice. Night, night made. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all. We look forward to seeing you in the fall, well, in the summer, Kristen mm -hmm. and Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks folks. Have a great night.